the new documentary, A Concerto is a Conversation, uh, is nominated for Best Documentary Short at this year's Oscars. I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby here with the film's directors, Ben Proudfoot and Chris Bowers. And Chris, I kind of want to start with you on this one because this is, you know, this film kind of hit me in a certain way because of, you know, my own relationship with my grandfather. Um, and so... Um, Let's talk about the genesis of this, because I've read kind of how this all came together. It comes together in a very kind of interesting way. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Ben and I have been friends for a number of years, and Ben had originally reached out because the L.A. Phil had commissioned him to write or uh, uh, create a, a shoot a doc um, that focused on the intersection of music in Los Angeles. And he saw that I was writing this by Lincoln Sherdo that be at Disney Hall, and I'm from L.A. And so he originally reached out to uh, possibly follow me working on this concerto. And it just so happened that the day we met to just have a conversation about this doc and, and uh, we met at my studio, I was coming from an event that celebrated my grandfather. And so it was an early Tuesday morning and Ben was like, why are you so dressed up this early in the morning on a Tuesday? And uh, I said, oh, I was coming from this event um, at the cleaners that my family owns that my grandfather started in the 1940s. and. Uh, and uh, just kind of started going into my grandfather's story. And Ben, I think, you know, having had a lot of time in this space and doing a lot of short documentaries on families, really, or a lot of people's stories and their family stories, really good at pulling the thread. And, and eventually this whole story of my grandfather's journey from Bascom, Florida to Los Angeles and to buying the cleaners and then to really laying the groundwork and foundation for our whole family came out and Ben was like, I think that's a much more interesting story. How can we follow that? And how can we uh, kind of find a parallel between that and your process working on this concerto and tie those two things together? And from that point on, it became really collaborative. And, and Ben asked if, if my grandfather would be interested, if I would be willing to interview him for that and and um, had this idea of using the double interatron for that conversation element. And, um, you know, we kind of went from there. So it was really that moment and, and and really Ben and both of us being able to be that malleable and uh, adjustable to go with that and, and turn this into a film that can celebrate my grandfather and his story. Yeah, and I wanna talk about that technique too because it is so striking um, about, you know, the, it is this conversation between, between Chris and his grandfather, but it is kind of in this straight to camera sort of way and i want to know what was the genesis of that of that technique i mean it could have just easily been some other sort of cinematic sort of thing but you chose that one why did you choose that one yeah so that i'll, I'll pick up on that so i i you know being in the in the short documentary world of things for quite a while i had stolen the interatron technique from errol morris um who who obviously developed it um, and I had always kind of had an idea in the back of my mind that wouldn't it be great if, if there was a film that could kind of hold it or that made sense to have, we could have two at the same time and you could kind of like be in the center of uh, a conversation. And it's sort of from a film grammar perspective, it's unusual. Like we all know about the 180 line, you're not supposed to cross it, you're not supposed to meet it. How is this going to work? And we just didn't know. But, you know, that's the fun part of short documentary is you can experiment and try something new. And so that's what we tried to do. And we have gotten untold emails and messages from filmmakers, documentarians who want to talk about that particular element, because even though it's, it's using sort of familiar things, direct address, et cetera, the, the, the two at the same time has really started a lot of interesting conversations about the, the nature of the documentary interview and, you know, how, how that has kind of like pushed the envelope a little bit in a certain direction. And I think, at least for me, really brings me closer to um, Chris and his grandfather and, and makes it such an, you, you, brings you into a very intimate conversation that um, almost, I think, lives in your memory as if it's something, a conversation that you've had. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm curious, Chris, what did your grandfather think of the, of the way that, I mean, he's, he's obviously, you know, a guy who just says exactly what he thinks and is very kind of, you know, I, I, I found so many parallels between him and my own grandfather. It was, it was really eerie at times. I'm wondering what, what was his view in terms of like the whole camera thing and the, and the interview technique? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's interesting about that, that generation. And like you said, how they um, uh, definitely 
tell you how they feel. And there are a lot of times actually making the film where my grandfather was just very honest about like, oh, that's not really going to work. Or I don't know how I feel about that. But the his comfortability with the the Interatron was actually pretty immediate. You know, and I think that a lot of that is because you're looking at uh, a screen of the other of of what the other camera is capturing. So for me, I felt like I was looking directly at my grandfather's image and for him, it it felt the same. And on top of that, it feels like what we're doing now, or, or if you have FaceTime or any of those kinds of things, it's it's the exact same process. And so he very quickly got used to it. I don't, there was ever, there was never a moment where he felt uncomfortable. And I think a lot of times, you know, even moments where he's looking off camera, really, I think that's just because he's, he's, uh, maybe having a tough time talking about whatever he's talking about or trying to recall some of those memories or things like that. But as far as the comfortability, we sat there and talked for, I don't know, Ben, what do you think, but maybe like three or four hours and stopped yeah. maybe twice in that, in that whole time, maybe, yeah, two or three times. And, you know, it was just a, a constant flow of a conversation. There weren't very many moments, if at all, of us stopping to say, well, what do we talk about now? Or do I ask you now? It was just like, okay, like, what about this? And my grandfather was just there and, and answering questions and, until he had to take a bathroom break. But other than that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious, you know, I, th I, I love the title, not just in reference to the, the reference at the beginning when you're kind of explaining to your grandfather what a, what a conversation is, what a concerto is in terms of the, the conversation between the soloist and the ensemble. Um, I, I'm curious if that, if, if the conversation portion of the title is a reference also to other things that you're covering in the documentary. Oh, that's a very interesting theory. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've been, I, 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 I definitely think that it jumped to the top of our list um, of titles for that exact reason that you point out that there's sort of a metaphorical element to, you know, to the idea of, well, I mean, there's, there's the idea that Chris paints of the soloist and the orchestra, right? And I think there's a clear metaphor there between, you know, us as an individual and the rest of society or our ancestors or what have you um, that the film, you know, thinks about. But I think, there, I think the other thing is, is that, um, you know, a concerto is a singular thing and a conversation has two parties. And I think, I think you know, what, what emerges out of the film is the idea that, you know, Chris and his career doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lineage. We, we all sort of emerge from a lineage of decision makers, uh, that resulted in us. Um, and so I think it sort of captured, uh, both the intrigue of, well, what is a concerto doesn't really answer the question. Um, but also the different layers of metaphor that we were trying to, to stack into this 13 minute film as rich a possible, uh, a story. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of the things that I think jumped out at me um, was, you know, the story of of your grandfather, Chris, and and his the the attitudes that he faced in the Jim Crow South before he came to California, and finding out that those attitudes maybe weren't that different, but were maybe just expressed differently. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I'm so glad that my grandfather said that in the film because growing up that's something that he did talk about a lot is that he he almost said that he preferred the racism in the south because at least they told him how they felt and then once he got to los angeles they showed him uh you know and and i feel like he was very quick to pick up on any sort of racism and i think that's that's something for anyone that comes from that environment in the jim crow south to then go to a place like los angeles or anywhere else that um you know black people went during the great migration i feel like you uh, get there and, and I think my grandfather maybe had a brief moment of thinking that that he wouldn't experience racism, but because that was just so real for him, I think once he started to recognize what was happening when he was denied a loan, once he showed up, even though he was approved over the phone or you know somebody continued to fail him on a certain test for the cleaners that he um, uh, knew he was acing every time and then he just went and took the test somewhere else and passed it immediately and like all these different things I think what was helpful in, in some kind of strange way is the fact that he had the experience of growing up in the Jim Crow South so that as soon as he hit one of those moments, he immediately tried to find a way to get around that and find a way to just continue to persevere and all of that. But, but he, um, yeah, has, has constantly felt that, that uh, 
racism is is really much more malleable and and covert than we think it is and there are so many times where we, you know we feel like we can say something's not racist because it's not uh overt or, or very obvious but then if you actually look into some of the ways that the system's been built or or some of the private attitudes attitudes of some of the people within it you know you can start to see that and so growing up for me with that in mind i think it's been um interesting especially the older i get you know it's interesting to grow up with that in mind when my grandparents and my parents did so much work so that i didn't really feel uh like overt racism in, in, in my life when i was a child or a lot of these difficulties that they faced i didn't feel at all when i was a child and then to start to feel those things as i get older and get into the industry or to experience different people and different attitudes and all that kind of stuff uh it's, it's always never, never. I'm curious as to, you know, Ben, you, you, you've done so many documentary films and Chris, you know, you've, you've worked definitely more on like the, the composition side and, and scoring. So I'm curious as to, um, in your guys' working relationship, how you found that each of your backgrounds helped benefit the other in terms of, you know, this particular story. Yeah, a lot, a lot of different ways. I mean, I think obviously it's a super musical film, right? And and not just about the subject of a concerto, but the 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 actual fabric of the film itself is constantly switching between diegetic and non-diegetic music. Uh, Chris playing on screen to score to to a live recording of the the orchestra. All of those things needed to be choreographed and scored by Chris and discussed and with the sound designer, et cetera. Um, that was like a huge layer of the film that like made up the structure that I was like extremely <laughs> grateful for Chris's involvement because uh, that's not my expertise at all. And then I, I can tell you having conducted hundreds of interviews, there's no way that the, the conversation that Chris and his grandfather had would have been the same if I was the one on the other side of the, the camera. Um, and so a lot of the time I was just playing facilitator of, you know, here's, here's the, here's what happens next in the process. I did a lot of heavy lifting in the editorial. Um, but it, it, as, as soon as we, it, as soon as in that first meeting, Chris, when I said, I want to make a film about you, Chris, and Chris said, well, and he was crediting his grandfather for his situation we kind of just like turned in the same direction. Um, and it just became the best wording I can describe is kind of like a, uh, like an art, an art project where we're all sort of like piling in and it just kept saying yes to the demands of the project. Um, and, you know, I think, I think, I think it just sort of became one of those things where you we just started started giving of our of our of ourselves um but those are the two big things that i feel like you know were took the film to the next level was the interview and the contribution from an, a musical expertise standpoint from that's that's my from my perspective i don't know but from chris perspective yeah yeah perspective. yeah for me I, I feel like one just that that initial um inkling to to hear me talk about my grandfather in my mind you know divided from this idea of what we were talking about and for Ben to pull that into the fold, I feel so appreciative of because without that, we wouldn't have this film and I wouldn't have this like really beautiful gift to my family and, and something that I can hold on to and cherish for for, for the rest of my life. And, um, and also just being able to, I'll never forget one of the things that Ben said early on when we shot the cleaner sequence was that if we can make this moment where where my grandfather passes this jacket to me, feel like the end of the film and feel like this moment of celebration, then we, we really won with the film. Uh, instead of it being on Chris finishing the concerto and the, the Disney Hall, concert hall, you know, audience standing up or anything like that. And us being able to focus on that um, and using that as our North Star, I feel like is, is so incredibly helpful to shaping this film and finding a way to condense, you know, my grandfather's story, my journey and this idea of of what it means to be a black man uh, in in this country into 13 minutes, I feel like you know all just became uh, all, all as a result of us focusing on my grandfather's story and and really making sure that that moment felt like it really landed. Um, and then I also say just uh, with the way that Ben represented my, me and my family, I feel so appreciative of just because one the, I remember the first day we we showed up to shoot at my grandparents' house 
and for me, I mean, as as the story goes of our meeting about the concerto the, or the the film the first time, I showed up with like a button up shirt and I was like really dressed up and I'm thinking in my mind like my mom's gonna watch this. I want to make sure that it feels like I'm respecting my grandfather's face, like all this and. Then it was like, would you really wear that to your grandparents' house? He was like, what, what would you wear to your grandparents' house? And like, just make this feel as comfortable as possible. Or me being at home and like, what would you actually be wearing if you were working really late at night and all that kind of stuff and, and facilitating a space for me to feel comfortable to be myself and for me to like ask these questions that I that I have in my, my heart and mind and, and want to ask. And then immediately after we finished shooting, I knew that the film was in great hands because I immediately got a call from my parents being like, yeah, Ben now is connecting with, you know, this family down in Bascom and he wants to know if we have any pictures of this and blah, blah, blah. And, and just that amount of research and dedication, like somebody could have easily have made this film where it was just our conversation and that's all we needed to, to, to show, but to really take that much effort and, and ex excavating this story that it's really hard to excavate because there's not that much material there. And, and I think it just, all of us can really um, appreciate it. I mean, me, because it's my own family, but you know, anybody that can look at the history of their family and look at it being presented in this cinematic, really big way, when it's just this man that, that was trying to do the best for his, for his family, I feel like uh, I, it, was, it really, really just speaks to Ben uh, as, a, as a creator and director, for sure. Uh, last a mutual, question. A mutual love fest between yeah. <laughs> It's almost like you guys are in perfect harmony. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. There's your headline. <laughs> um, last question. Um, uh, Chris, are you going to bring your grandfather to the Oscars? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the plan. I mean, he's, he, um, he, his, his cancer is like having some complications. And so he, uh, he, might need to start some treatments but he actually pushed all the treatments back because he was like i gotta go to the oscars i don't have time to deal with this cancer stuff and um and yeah we we just have to figure out how to make it as comfortable for him as possible uh given that it's it's a long night and, and a lot of moving but um but he's he's already excited and and figuring out what he's gonna wear so he's he's gonna be there that's the whole <laughs> I love it. Uh, gentlemen, congratulations. It's, it's, just a, it's just a wonderful film. Everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Oscars, and stay tuned for more interviews throughout the season. Ben Proudfoot, Chris Bowers, congratulations. Best of luck. Thank you. Thanks, Tony.